and record on this computer. Yes, the recording right. has begun. Thank you. All right. This open meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, and the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the Governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. I hereby call to order the August 12th meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee at uh, 7, uh, 7 p.m. I'm Narissa Wallen, Chair of the Triton Regional School Committee, and I would like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Aaron? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Paul Goldner? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Maureen? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Lees? I'm here and I can hear you. Thanks. Linda? Linda? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mayette? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Tina? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Triton Superintendent Brian Forget. I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Assistant Superintendent Kim Croto. I'm here and I can hear you. School Business Official Kyle Warren. I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. And Special Education Director Dave McKee. Oh, there he is. I see him. Yep, it's still me. I'm here and <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Um, for this meeting, the Triton School Committee is convening remotely via Zoom using the information posted on the district's website identifying how the public may join. If you are personally attending by video conference using your device's camera, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Committee members and administrators, please remember to mute your computer or phone when you are not speaking. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the district's website with the agenda posting unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, and now I will read aloud the district vision statement. We are a community of learners known for our unwavering commitment to meeting the needs of all students. Through the adoption of best practices and our active partnership with families and the wider community who are united in supporting the development of engaged, successful, responsible, resilient learners, students will be well prepared to be ethical, empathetic, and contributing citizens. All right, um, so my name is Narissa Wallen and I'm chair of the Triton School Committee and um, welcome to everyone that's joining us on this call. Um, I just wanna note up front, cause I know this can be a little confusing. Um, this is a meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee with the administrators in public. It's not a meeting with the public. So we can't engage in discussion. Um, we won't be able to handle chat questions uh, if you're sending them to me during the meeting. Um, that's something that has to be done separately. We have emails set up for that if you want to do it that way. Um, we do have a period on the agenda where you can make a statement to the committee and administration, um, but during that time, it, it can't be a discussion or a question and answer or back and forth. Forth, it does truly have to be a statement, a statement. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, first, I wanted to rehash real quickly the um, kind of process that led us here. Uh, we obviously, uh, I don't want to go all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic days, but as far as this reopening process, um, it really started before the school year ended last year. Um, there are a couple of different avenues that this has been taking. Um, there's a um, reopening working group, uh, which I can say as a district, I think we are tremendously lucky to have and um, grateful to because I've heard of a lot of other districts that are planning with very small committees and we have um, approximately 65 on ours right now. Um, it has students, it has parents, it has um, teachers um, from all different disciplines, it has um, other staff members represented from um, from you know other um, I guess jobs positions in the in the district. Um, there are uh, union representatives that are included on there, um, and that's been led by Assistant Superintendent Kim Croto, uh, who's done a fantastic job on that. Um, 
separately from that, the um, school committee has been meeting weekly, sometimes twice a week um, during that time period. So uh, the working group has been doing a lot of the kind of detail work. Uh, and then the school committee does a lot of the um, kind of higher level work. So we do a lot of policy and budget and things like that or that are kind of the overarching framework that the district um, operates within. Uh, so those meetings have been going on. Um, there, uh, it's kind of part of the basis of that, I would say. Um, there have been a variety of surveys that have gone out to look at um, what happened in the spring, uh, see where improvements were needed there. Um, there is a lot of guidance from the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, I was trying to actually count them up earlier, and a lot of times it's a two or three documents buried in one communication. I think there are roughly a dozen of them, but uh, hard to get an accurate count. Uh, those started coming in um, June, June 25th and then um, sort of ramped up in early July and they continue to come. Um, we're still missing some key ones. So I know one of the most common questions that I've gotten is what about sports? And the answer is we don't know yet because we haven't been given guidance. Um, so you know, um, Maya and, and uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are still having that discussion and I guess we'll have guidance when we have it that we can then base our, our local um, work on and decisions on uh, that. Um, so, so that guidance has, um, has, like I said, continued to come and uh, we've built a lot of our work on that and continue to, to adapt as that's come out. Um, this has culminated in a, um, an initial plan um, being filed on uh, the 31st of July. Uh, that includes three models includes three models. All of our uh, plans are actually built around the three models, one being uh, fully remote, one being a hybrid, a remote and in-person um, hybrid model, and uh, the last one being a full in-classroom model. And I'll just note, because again, another common question that we've been kind of getting hit with along the way, um, is that there are um, exceptions in the hybrid and the fully remote models um, for high need students that need, may need more in-person time uh, than uh, what's provided for in the particular model that the district is in. Um, so if, if you have a student that falls in those groups, I would definitely uh, take a look through the plan uh, so that you can review that specifically uh, around kind of your student circumstances. Uh, Monday night, the days are all kind of blending together now. Monday night, um, we voted the model, um, which is going to be a fully remote model. And uh, we also voted the first day of school, which will be September 16th. Um, it was pushed out later because there is was a um, memorandum of understanding uh, that was signed by uh, the Commissioner of Education for Massachusetts, as well as Mass Teachers Association, the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts, and Boston Teachers Union that added um, um, 10 days worth of professional development to the start of the school year before uh, students return to the classroom. The, um, the model I just want to come back to for a second because I think this has been kind of a common question over, uh, over the last couple of days that I've gotten. Um, there were, I would say, a number of things and um, during when we get to the discussion, I think uh, maybe the committee will talk possibly more about this as we're hitting on, on things through the final plan that we'll be going through tonight. Um, but what I heard from the committee members were a variety of things as far as concerns with having um, a number of students in person. Um, one of those was definitely around um, testing availability in this area. Um, particularly for minors, which has been an ongoing concern um, that we've been researching and working on. Uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of the testing for minors in this area is taking eight to 10 days, 10 to 12 days um, to turn around. And unfortunately, that is not fast enough for us to mount a response um, when there is a positive case in the district um, to kind of halt the transmission where it's at. Um, so that's been an ongoing concern. And additionally, the accessibility of that, um, we're hearing cases of you know families calling a pediatrician, the pediatrician is referring into a hospital emergency room. Um, it's just when we're talking about the potential for um, larger numbers of students needing to get tested, that's an extremely, uh, I'd say, difficult process to go through, especially when some, um, 
some pediatricians, from what I'm understanding, are referring to Lawrence General, uh, Union Hospital, and Lynn. Um, that's a, a, a significant hardship on some families to be able to make um, make that kind of a trip to go get a test done when there may not be a car readily available, um, or you know whatever the family situation may be. Um, so there are testing issues that I think um, we've heard that need to be resolved. And then contact tracing is another concern. Um, contact tracing, particularly done after the fact, because if there is a positive case in the school, uh, there are going to be a significant number of students and staff members who will need to isolate, potentially be tested, and then tracked through that period by the public health nurses. Um, we have been working with the town health departments, um, which are typically a half-time um, health agent and a half-time public health nurse apiece. Um, they are terrific. I mean, I, we have no complaints about those individuals. I think they've been, they've been wonderful in providing guidance to us. Um, I think the biggest concern is that we, we potentially could be handling, handing large numbers of close contacts um, with potential exposures um, to half-time individuals. They're concerned, I, I mean, I heard from them in, in our discussions with them that they're concerned about their capacity um, to be able to contact trace for um, the level of contacts that could be involved in a school situation. Um, they also have concerns about um, about discrepancies between Mass Department of Public Health guidance and the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education guidance. Um, I know that they have been appealing to the Mass Department of Public Health for a number of weeks um, to try and get some answers to that. And as yet, um, as of the last time I heard, which I think was Monday, um, they haven't received any substantial responses to that. It's been a, um, you know, we're gonna research this, we're gonna look into this and then we'll get back to you. Um, during that discussion also came up um, the pedagogy that was, um, that is, um, I guess, the difficulty, shall I say, of the pedagogy uh, with students who are six feet apart in a classroom, in set spaces, unable to move around that classroom, and who have um, masks on during that time that they're being taught. Um, and I, I'd say there are a couple of other small issues. Um, I think we had heard mentioned the, um, the uh, kind of large area that some of our students um, come from outside the district um, that are coming into the district as well as um, teachers who uh, don't live within our district limits that are coming in from other communities, um, potentially com communities that have um, higher rates um, of cases and new cases in their communities than we do. Um, so that was that was Monday. Tonight we are um, voting the final plan, which has to go into the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, this will be based on the plan that was reviewed on Monday. There were a number of, um, I would say, requests for clarification and for more information that the committee asked the administration to um, to fold into this final document and make sure it included. And then, of course, the two votes that happened on Monday night um, are included in here as well. Um, the initial plan primarily just laid out the the three different models for um, for the school reopening uh, and didn't make a decision on based on you know toward one of them, um, which we now have that information. So that is um, going to be included in the final plan as well. So I am going to now open um, oral communications from the public. And I have a quick um, legalese that I need to read aloud for that. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public, the meeting host muted you as you entered the meeting. If you would like to address the committee, please indicate now that you would like to do so, either by raising your hand on your video call or using the raise hand option on the participant screen. The meeting host will unmute you so that you can address the committee. Please refer to the public comment policy language on the agenda when making your comments and remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. When you have finished speaking, the meeting host will mute you again. And I'll just read aloud quickly the oral communications uh, statement. Members of the public may address the committee for up to three minutes, longer with the permission of the chairperson. The committee will not engage in a discussion on topics raised during public comment, but may choose to add the topic to a future agenda. This agenda segment will be limited to 15 minutes and less extended at the discretion of the chairperson. All right, so um, opening it up for comments then, and I see Erica and Cole Jacobson. You can unmute or we can unmute you if 
There we go. And I, you have three it's minutes. Cole, it's Cole that wants to address. Hi, I'm, right. a, Hello, Cole. I'm a sophomore at Triton. And I had a few points that I wanted to go over. First of all, thanks for letting me speak, speak here today. I just wanted to say that I fully support the idea of remote learning for the start of the school year. And there's a few issues I want to address before then. First, first concern that the remote learning should be the go-to plan when it comes to the uncertainty right now. I feel that our education outweighs the social aspect. I understand that some people are miss, missing seeing their friends and face to face, but it's not the right time. I also hear that some, some of my classmates are disappointed in missing some of the social events going on, especially the seniors. But I, it's not the right idea of, it's not the right idea at this time due to the risk of spreading COVID, getting family members sick, or quite possibly dying themselves. We shouldn't be putting these events on such a high pedestal anyways. My classmates and I would be able to focus more on in a remote learning environment instead of being in school and constantly having to be stressing about who, who's touched what, whose mask may be down, who's coughed in class. Uh, and, and even if the bathrooms have soap or clean water. Mask, also on the topic of mask wearing, I've seen plenty of adults and even people my age failing to keep their masks up, even if they have a mask around their ears. They just leave it down, not even covering the nose or even just on the chin. Thank you for, thank you for the time, energy, and detail you guys have gone into this, and thanks for letting me speak today. Thank you, Cole. Thank you. Um, thanks, Erica. <laughs> um, next, there's uh, Jean. I don't see you on my list, but I see you there. Oh, now I lost her. I don't know if that was an unintentional hand up. Let me see if I can ask her to, uh, to unmute. Okay, I just unmuted myself. Hi, everyone. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for all the amazing hard work you're doing. Um, just a couple statements. I'm rephrasing them from questions on the fly, so <laughs> excuse any craziness. Okay, so I'd like to ask the school committee to increase the review cadence to every two weeks, at least for the first couple months. A two-week period aligns with the patterns for symptomatic patients since exposure and with self-quarantining guidelines. I'll add that without knowing the transition time to a different model, a four-week review cadence seems long. And then just one other statement. Um, I, um, how do I phrase this? Not as a question. I would like to suggest, uh, if it's not already being considered, that some uh, measurement be in place for determining what uh, the decision is coming out of the reviews. Um, in the last meeting, I know that it was mentioned um, the committee was going to be looking at what other districts are doing and how they're trending. Um, however, I feel strongly that there should be some other um, point, you know, whether it's the new map that was put out yesterday or the day before by the governor or, um, you know, rates, you know, less than or equal to 1% per 1,000 uh, new cases in the district, uh, something like that, so that maybe a combination of um, metrics, some, some measurement, and anecdotal information from other districts can uh, help determine, you know, whether or not and when to transition to a different model. And then also just that I think these would be beneficial whether you're transitioning from fully remote to one of the less fully remote models or vice versa. You know, if we end up transitioning to hybrid and then have to transition back, you know, I could see where a two week review would benefit there too. So um, that's it. Thanks for the time and thanks for listening. All right, thank you. Anyone else that wants to speak in public comment? I'm taking a scroll through the video feeds. Hi, uh, sorry, it's Whitney Hunt. I'm not able to get to a- Oh, okay, you're not on a- Well, by all means, go ahead and then- <laughs> Go ahead, Whitney. Um, so I just wanted to 
I just wanted to comment on the testing part of it because I am a physician and I work outside of this area. However, it's very easy to get testing done. So I think that is an area that could be enhanced, certainly, from Anna Jake. Um, it does seem as though when I spoke to the hospital, Anna Jake's hospital, as well as their access sort of testing preparation sites and my pediatrician locally, um, that they are seeing patients eight to five with Sunday through Saturday. Um, so it seems like there's lots of open slots. I'm hearing it takes a day to get an appointment and then it does take four to five days to get the testing back, which is definitely still a little bit on the long side, but it, it seems like working with Boston, that should be a priority for sure for the hospital as well as for our district. Um, the rapid testing is challenging right now as the fact that the machines are hard to come by. But I think that's also another thing to look into with the state trying to send in a rapid team to do rapid testing if there's a case that opens up in, you know, in, in any school in Massachusetts. I haven't seen that on any of the state guidelines, but it's something to think about. And lastly, I just thought it'd be curious to see um, if there are going to be any additional changes based on the letter that was sent out, my understanding is today, to the superintendents regarding opening based on the current status of COVID percentages in your community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deb? Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, um, thanks so much. So, so first of all, thank you again. I think I've said this uh, about a thousand times, but thank you to Narissa and Brian and the school committee and everybody for really all of the tremendous work that you've been doing to get us to this point. Um, I, I will say that I've been an advocate for the hybrid model. Um, so when the decision came out on Monday night, um, I, I, was, um, I was unhappy with the, with the result. Um, but I, the, the reality is, is there's, there's really no good answer. Um, so I, I, I understand that and I respect it. Um, but what I have been thinking about and, and what I just want to put forth to the committee is that um, looking through the plan, this very robust 37 page or 39 page plan, I realized that there's about a page and a half of the plan that is dedicated to the fully remote model. And it, it, it doesn't seem sufficient. And, um, and it, um, it seems very vague. And I know that the, our intent is to have a much more robust remote model than we had in the spring. And I'm having a difficult time understanding how the model is going to be different from what we had in, in, in the spring. And so I'd like to ask the school committee to lay out a plan that is, uh, that, that, that it takes into account as much detail as you spent on the hybrid plan, which was incredibly robust. And, um, and, and present that to the, to the community as well. So we have a better understanding of what is going to be different and, um, and, and how our students are going to be engaged and how the content is going to be delivered and uh, what the schedule is going to look like and things along those lines. So, um, so that was my only comment. Thank you so much for everything that you're all doing and, um, and for the time to speak. Thank you. Um, Wendy? I like your background, Hi. Wendy. I'm sorry? Um, I, said I, like I don't your know background. how to change that. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to hit a couple points, some that were already made regarding the letter that was sent out Tuesday night to superintendents regarding the map that was put out by the governor. Um, they seem to be confident that we're in a position number-wise to reopen either fully or in a remote model. I'm totally for the remote model. Uh, I'm sorry, the hybrid model. Um, my daughter is a very slow learner. She fell behind tremendously just from the spring shutdown. I'm beginning to get the feeling, she's going into the sixth grade. I'm beginning to get, to the, get the feeling I'm gonna end up with a kid going into the seventh grade with a fifth grade education level. And that was despite all the teacher's hard work. She gets support in school she learns best in school. She is not learning remotely. Another point I wanted to bring up was the four week reviews. I think that's a lot of time between reviews. Um, I think two weeks would be sufficient. 
for reviews, I think four weeks is a long time. Um, I'd also like to see the kids go back in a hybrid model to, to start with, because if flu cases do start taking up hospital beds or we do get hit with a second wave, we're gonna have to go fully remote anyway. I say, let's give the kids that need some classroom time, some classroom time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go, I'm gonna scan video again. If anyone else wants to speak either, please put your hand up using the raise hand option or Hillary. if you have video, you can say, click it on. Hillary O'Doy is raising a real hand. Oh, raising a real hand. There, oh, she's, she's clapping. There she is. Sorry, Hillary, <laughs> go ahead. I can't figure out this raise hand thing, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. You got, I, it's so evident that you're working so hard. I, As an educator myself, I just reopened a program uh, last week and it was one of the most stressful things I've ever done. We're back and we're absolutely thrilled that we have and we know the risk that we're taking by putting teachers at risk. Um, we also feel that the wellness of our students and the mental health of the kids that are back in class right now, it's just a win, it's a win-win um, for all of us. So I do appreciate how much work goes into this. I see how hard you're working. I just had a few questions. Um, Jean raised a point about the timing and I think the four weeks does feel long. I'm really curious to, at that, at that point, whenever you meet, whether it's four weeks or two weeks, I'd love for us to understand more about what the parameters are and what you're actually looking at. I, it sounds like the challenges are testing, um, and you're worried about a turnaround time. We just traveled, my family just traveled back to North Carolina and had results within 24 hours um, at a clinic in Newburyport. So I'm curious about the discrepancy there. Um, and I understand the tracing. Um, that's a concern of ours at our program as well. But I'm, I'm wondering what other markers will there be um, when you're making that four-week decision? Is it that the numbers are even lower? Is it that the testing has improved? Are there things that are in your control or not in your control at all that will keep us stuck in this remote um, situation and consider us not to move forward to hybrid. So I'd love, I, you know, I appreciate Brian at the last meeting, you had them kind of reshape the motion to be like, well, instead of just a motion to go remote, let's make it a motion to review every four weeks. Could, could we get more information um, about what those decision-making protocols or, or, or I guess those, those markers are? Um, and that was really it. I, I'm just so grateful for all that you're doing. I'm disappointed to not go back hybrid. I, I do feel like this is the chance for us to go back. We are in the white zone. Um, having experienced it myself, it's the most stressful thing I've done. But uh, you know, I think the mental health piece that Narissa spoke to last time, I, I worry about um, having watched you know, some of my family members who do struggle with mental wellness. Uh, in that six month shutdown, it was really hard for them. And I, I do worry that if we don't get some slice of normalcy back, there is no normal. I know this is a new normal for all of us. That if we don't take the opportunity now to get them back for even a short time, um, that this six months will feel like an eternity. Um, so I do worry about that. But I, I, I'm just grateful for all the decisions. This has been such a transparent process. Um, I'm so grateful for all the work you're doing, and I'm I'm so glad that I don't have to vote. <laughs> it's just a really it's a really hard decision. So thank you for all your time and effort, and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Hillary. Um, anyone else? Uh, Matthew Doring? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be brief, um, in part because I've spent 14 years agreeing with uh, Jean Master and Hillary Adoyer, so I have no reason to stop, to stop doing that now. But, uh, and thank you for everyone for your time. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, two suggestions. Um, information is just so critical just to, to build on what Hillary said. I greatly appreciate um, the oversharing, uh, and I mean as a positive, uh, that Superintendent Forger does uh, with his correspondence to us. Uh, Narissa, what you do, even just on informal Facebook pages, is wonderful because um, this topic is so divisive in the community. And it goes beyond the students, as I'm sure all of you have experienced, probably and unfortunately firsthand, uh, that information is really the, the, the best sword and shield that you have. So please continue to, to share as much as you can. Um, the one comment I'll make is that I had last year I had an eighth grader and a junior who will be a senior and freshman this year. And the disparity between the online learning experiences that they had was um, stark uh, and unsettling at times. Um, I think re remote learning can work. Um, I'm, an, I'm, I'm not happy with the result, but I'm, I'm going to live with it and we're all going to do our best. But I'm hoping that the teachers are given the the tools 
uh, they need um, to, to really embrace this head on. I understand the spring, it caught all of us by surprise. Um, but as a parent, I was extremely disappointed in the level of education that my kids were receiving. I'm gonna give everybody a pass because no one was ready for it. Um, hopefully now with four or five months, we're gonna be more ready for it. So I guess I would just hope that the teachers have the resources they need and that there's some sort of, I don't know if it's an over, oversight's the wrong word because I love our teachers, but just some sort of check as to the types of lesson plans um, that are being put in place. Um, because if it's a continuation of what we saw in the spring, um, you know, I, I, I just don't think it's gonna be good for any of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tatro? Oh, it's Martha Tatro. First of all, I want to, how you guys all doing? <laughs> surviving. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surviving. I won't say, how about that? <laughs> That's good. So I do want to say thank you uh, very much. Being on the other side um, as an educator in a totally different district, I know the amount of time, energy, effort, everything you guys have put into this. And it's something I can't even begin to appreciate you enough for. Um, so I do, I do want to put that out there. I think the one statement I want to make is something that I have already publicly shared. And so therefore I'm comfortable saying it here without an issue. And that is the whole testing piece um, kind of takes me off guard because I, I had an experience with it, took my kid locally, um, got tested, actually didn't need anything, um, got tested, right new report. At the time, they told us it was a five, you know, day wait, and then we discovered we could go up to Lawrence to the drive-through on Canal Street. Nine of us in different cars, clearly, all went up, all got tested, all had our results in less than forty-eight hours. And I know that some may think Lawrence is out of the way. Um, I pride myself very much in saying I was born and raised in Lawrence, and it's a pretty easy drive. And it was, in all honesty, the smoothest thing in terms of testing I had to do. And compared to Newburyport, it was amazing. So it, it is something I think we need to look at because there are many more options available. I think on the DESE, uh, on the, not the DESE site, the state site, there's 36 pages of testing sites in the state of Massachusetts. Some of which without question are free. You need no appointments, you just show up. Um, you know, and that has to do with the, stop the um, stop the spread initiative by the governor. So I'd, I'd like to see us really explore that. And I would like to, uh, I don't know, second, third, quadruple. I'd like to see us evaluate every two weeks and not four. Um, and if possible, have a conversation about a rolling return to a hybrid model where you're over the course of maybe six weeks returning by grade levels. So have younger kids, maybe one of the grade levels at the high school, then a couple weeks later, add a couple more levels, uh, one more grade level at the high school, and then finally add, you know, add the final piece. So a rolling return is an option, so not all the kids are in the building at the same time. Again, I wish to say thank you. It is not an easy process. Everything you are doing is truly appreciated, and be good. Thank you. Uh, anyone else that wants to address the committee? Looking for either a real hand on a video or a virtual hand on the um, the, the uh, screen using the raise hand option. All right, seeing none, I will um, I will apologize again that we can't answer questions that came in from the the. Um, the public comment, although I will say that I think a lot of them are actually going to be addressed as the superintendent talks about his uh, a final plan and the changes that have been made and updates to it. Um, so with all that said, I am going to hand it over to Superintendent Forget to go through those changes. And I, I really like the term oversharing, Brian, because I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I appreciate way. that. And you said it as a compliment. I've, I, yeah, he I've did. Never, I've, and it's it, true. It's right. There's a thumbs up, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been accused of under talking. Um, <laughs> So is that the official handoff? There's the handoff. That's the official handoff, thank you. So I, I don't wanna reiterate everything that Narissa said. Obviously she did a, a nice summary of, um, 
of what we discussed on Monday night and the decisions you made. Um, the, the draft that the committee has before them is not publicly available. It's basically the same document um, with some edits proposed, um, as well as um, if you see as you look through, there is an opening letter that I've written to the community Obviously, basically just uh, introducing um, this process and the process we use with the reopening uh, working group, um, as well as the three models. Um, the executive summary is what I'll, I'll just walk you through. Um, this is hopefully giving everyone a sense of the three options, the process we used to develop the three options, uh, the process used to decide on an option, as well as the calendar and first day and such. Um, I know, uh, I know we're not supposed to uh, speak to sp specific comments, but I, I know the comment about the remote uh, section not being as robust as the hybrid section. We actually had various drafts where it repeated a lot of the same language. And in theory, then, the remote is a, is a fully structured um, concept of the remote days that we would be having. Obviously, it's different. Um, but in a hybrid model where some students are remote and some students are in, in the classroom, um, the remote day concept gets fully teased out um, for all students on a daily basis in the remote model. So as we go through, I, I don't know the committee's um, thoughts that isn't obviously redrafted in this document you have here tonight. Um, I can certainly add more context um, in, before it gets submitted to the Department of Education and, and, and sent out to the community tomorrow. Um, I don't know if you want to come back and reapprove that or if you would be willing to accept my amendments um, as uh, in trust that I'll provide a little more context. Um, so the executive summary um, goes through again the, the three the, uh, kind of key points on the, under, on the, the umbrella under which this was all developed, obviously the physical safety of students and staff, equitable access for everyone and the focus on social, emotional, and mental health. Um, that is the design, that is the umbrella under which everything, all decisions, every conversation that the 60 plus person uh, reopening working group in some way um, was touching on those three aspects uh, through all the decisions and discussions that happened um, since June. Um, the three key findings I think are important. It's important to note that we acknowledge some people have, um, several people have commented both tonight, emails, online, what have you, um, the concern about the spring. And we've said that repeatedly. Um, we, and, and a lot of parents have said the same thing. This is not on the back of teachers. Teachers tried and teachers did phenomenal work um, over the course of the spring in going from uh, a Friday where we thought we were going home for a couple weeks at that point um, to not returning for the entire spring. So. Um, I, can, I can assure you, we have spent countless hours talking through what this will look like. It will look different. This is not just, I think the word someone was looking for was accountability. Certainly we need accountability in what will happen. But by the same token, every educator I've spoken with has been energized about coming back and finding in creative new ways to engage students remotely. So I think this is, you know, from top to bottom, this is an entirely different experience. Um, than what we went through in the spring. Um, we have time to plan, we have time to provision, we have time to provide, um, so I can't remember who mentioned it, but the resources and the training um, to prepare teachers uh, for the tools that they don't have. And they've, you know, they've said, here's what I need, we need this, we need this. And so we're working to get both the physical tools, the technology, um, as well as the training uh, that folks will identify areas where they need to strengthen. So. Um, the first key finding that we identified, and this was through anecdotally as well as through surveys, was the need for more consistency. Um, and I heard that um, in a comment tonight, that I'm not supposed to reference, um, in regards to the experiences of two different students. Unequivocally, yes, we need to find a way so that the learning experience, the level of rigor and challenge and engagement of students is consistent, whether your child is a first grader, a sixth grader, a senior, an eighth grader, um, it needs to be an academic program and it needs to be a full academic program for all days, even when a student is learning remotely. Um, talked about ac uh, access to consistent and reliable technology. That is important. Um, we are putting a Chromebook in every student's hand. Um, that's a, a great initiative. A little bit of a delay because everyone in the world is buying Chromebooks right now. Um, so we're working through the process to, to roll those out, but we will have a plan in place to roll those out um, so that every student has a consistent Chromebook um, the consistent piece of technology that we know works with the platforms that we choose. Um, and then expanding engagement opportunities for all students. 
um, students learn differently. And that's a challenge. Um, we have several educators on the school committee, educators are listening in and parents um, who are educators. It's a challenge to meet every, uh, the needs of all students in the classroom. Um, and so we have to find ways of engaging all students and that doesn't look the same for every student. So um, this is an all hands on deck approach. Um, uh, teachers get this in all the discussions I've had with educators. Um, people are going out of their way uh, to rethink, to, to challenge themselves and find ways to engage students. So that will be absolutely uh, something we continue. Um, but I think between the consistency of the, the teaching and learning, the technology and the way we're engaging students, um, I, I will never say that remote education replaces in-person learning because it does not. There is no way for anyone, um, well, I'm sure there's probably a way for someone to argue that. I would never argue that remote education can compare with in-person learning. So everything we do, we need to be moving towards bringing students back as much as we possibly can. Um, but in the interim, until we as a committee, as a community decide that that's safe, um, we, need to, we, we have to have a, a consistent and, and quality remote education. And I'm, I'm confident that we, with the planning and with the time we've had, um, we will be prepared when students walk through the door on September 16th. So in the executive summary, it goes over just a, a quick little summary of each of the models. Um, so certainly full in-person learning, it's the curriculum we're used to, it's the, um, the uh, instructional model, the instructional delivery that we're used to, obviously everything, the key difference is that we are um, doing that within uh, a framework that requires six foot distancing, masks, and what have you. So with all of those structures, it makes it a very different environment, a very different learning environment. Um, classrooms don't have much beyond desks and teachers. Um, and uh, even at six feet, we would need to be uh, expanding and using additional spaces um, in order, to, um, in order to, to maintain those six foot social distancing with, with all uh, students and teachers. So that was the full in-person learning model was ruled out um, in essence when the, the committee voted to uh, adopt the six foot standard uh, for social distancing that is um, universally standard with the CDC um, rather than the three foot standard which um, is being used by the Department of Ed. So, in the, in, in the full in-person model, service delivery, um, specialized services, interventions, obviously all look um, very similar uh, to what we would experience in a typical non-COVID time. Um, the difference being the social distancing and the, the rigorous structures that we have to put in place uh, to make sure that students are safe. Um, in the hybrid learning model, um, the difference, obviously the key difference is now students are not just in school, uh, they're alternating between in school and uh, learning remotely. Um, the model we landed on, there's, there's, I've done, I, there's probably more than you can count, different models and different uh, ways that um, districts approach looking at this. Uh, through all the discussions of our reopening group, um, we landed on a, a two day in and a three day uh, remote uh, with a set schedule. So cohort A is in on Tuesdays and Thursdays, cohort B is on uh, Wednesdays and um, Fridays. Um, in that cohort, and then, I'm sorry, and then um, on Mondays, everyone um, is remote. Um, that was the preference over, a, uh, in, at, at least on the uh, parent survey, um, uh, it was the preference rather than having an alternating day where sometimes students were in and sometimes students were home on that fifth day. Um, and obviously, in everything I've heard with uh, any of my discussions with parents, um, consistency is important. Um, because the, the more this fluctuates, the more challenging this becomes for families to plan. Um, so in the hybrid model, um, we, did, we did assess and we can do this safely. We can, do, uh, we can provide a hybrid uh, model or implement a hybrid model and maintain the six foot uh, social distance uh, metric. Um, the the uh, standard, the curriculum we teach, um, the grading, reporting, taking attendance all stays the same as it would in, as an in-person model. Um, the difference is obviously in the instructional delivery, um, the how we teach, the, the, the way we um, deliver the curriculum to students. So um, the, 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 um, uh, what's the, word I'm looking for? the schedules that are included in here as examples um, model the difference or the, the, the same um, aspects of an in-person schedule where um, we're following, even in a hybrid model where students are in some days and home and, and remote some days, the same schedule is going to be followed. 
so that students know that they can expect a rigorous schedule throughout the course of the day. We've had discussions about uh, their little tweaks that if we're in a fully remote that we might make, and I think there are some that make sense. Um, but in a hybrid model, students are following the same schedule on their remote day as they are in person. And on a remote day, obviously the in-person day looks very typical with the distancing. Um, obviously there's only half the students in the class, so the management of that and the safety um, is, is uh, more, um, is easier to do, or we are able to do that. Um, and then for the remote days, um, students are following that schedule. It is not a live stream that at the elementary starts at 8.30, 8.25 in the morning and ends at three o'clock. Um, at the high school, it doesn't start at 7.42 and end at 2.13. Um, it's a mixture of synchronous, which is live um, learning, which might be a stream from a classroom with a teacher. Um, it might be synchronously working with small groups of students at the secondary level where their students can work more independently. It might be a teacher working with a small group in a kindergarten classroom while um, students are doing some independent work. So that remote day is a blend of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So asynchronous, self-paced. Um, uh, again, asynchronous might be very different. It might be reading. It might be um, watching a pre-recorded video that a teacher recorded of her or himself. It might be watching a lesson off of Khan Academy and then joining the class for a synchronous discussion um, about that, that um, lesson that was viewed. So um, the, the key aspect of the hybrid model and similar to the remote model is that the, the days of remote, which is, I, I haven't heard many questions about what the in-person days look like. I think to, to the greatest degree possible, we make any in-person learning look very similar um, to a typical in-person learning. But the remote learning, which is where most people have the questions, is that following a schedule, it's a mixture of asynchronous and synchronous live learning, and there'll be multiple, multiple points per day. Um, not all day, again, it's not sitting in front of a computer all day, but multiple points per day where students are engaged um, live synchronously with their classroom teacher, another the support uh, personnel, an interventionist. Um, so this is, this is again very different where um, in the spring we moved from, it's not required, right? The first few weeks Desi was giving us all kinds of interesting information as they were trying to figure this out in, in fairness to them. Um, it wasn't required, then it was just enrichment and then we are requiring, but we can't take attendance. Um, so this is, this is very different in that we will take attendance. Um, we will have traditional grading, standards-based grading at the elementary and traditional grading at the secondary level. Um, the curriculum is the same. Again, it's the, it's the model, it's the delivery model that's changing. Um, so in, in this hybrid model, supporting our most at-risk learners um, becomes more challenging, obviously, than in the in-person. Um, so it, this document, uh, the full plan does uh, detail that our highest priority learners um, will be coming uh, to school on a daily basis in a hybrid model. Um, we spent, uh, the leadership team uh, this morning, spent some considerable amount of time talking about this, creating a metric to determine uh, which students are the highest need. And the, the kind of the threshold is, it's, we're talking about students who cannot learn remotely. That doesn't mean they can't learn as well remotely, because as I said earlier, everyone learns better in person and it's more challenging remotely. Um, but the, the highest priority learners are those who may be on an IEP, they might be an English learner, might be someone who has other challenges in learning and is providing, is receiving interventions um, where they are only able to access the curriculum and learn when they're in school. So this is not the majority of the population. Um, this is not automatically if a student is on an IEP, they qualify. Um, so we're going through the process in developing the metric using DESE guidance and developing the metric uh, to determine who qualifies for this high priority. And then we work, we'll, we'll work individually with those families um, to schedule them on a routine basis. It doesn't mean that if you're high priority on the hybrid model, on those days that are remote, it might be a portion, portion of the day that a student is in. It might be all day, every day. Um, it will vary based on student needs. So that's, that's the hybrid model. And then we move to the fully remote model. And again, um, to Hillary's comment, maybe, um, maybe this does need to be developed a little bit more um, and it was synthesized too much, but literally a fully remote model builds off of the remote days in a hybrid model and expands that to, to all day, every day. Um, similarly, um, the, the curriculum is the same, the standards are the same, 
We're still taking attendance. We're still providing grading and reporting standards based at the elementary, traditional at the secondary level. Um, where the, the, our most at-risk learners were more challenging in a hybrid model because we don't see them every day. Now, obviously, with a fully remote model, um, providing uh, services and interventions to those highest risk learners is even, uh, is even more challenging. So um, even in a remote model, as you've made the decision to, to start remotely, um, we will have learners, who students who are in, um, in school learning. Um, there'll be some who are coming in just for specific services as outlined on an IEP. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, really hard to do remotely. Um, there might be some whose disability is so great that they, they literally can't interact um, through a Zoom medium or other um, electronic communications. Um, or as I said earlier, language barriers or otherwise, it doesn't mean that every student who qualifies for this and this high risk or this high priority is gonna be in school all day, every day. Um, but there will be some who are in all day, every day, and some who are in partially, some, fun, some full days. So as I said, we're, we're creating that rubric, um, that metric as we speak, um, based off of the DESE guidance. And so that would apply to any remote learning, whether that's in a hybrid model or in a fully remote model. Um, other than that, this, the expectation stays the same. We have a consistent schedule that students follow all day long. Um, uh, at the high school level, um, we've been working through a block schedule, and so that would be consistent both in the hybrid and in the remote plan. Um, the block schedule, which is basically for those who don't know schedules, that's um, longer blocks um, rather than classes meeting more frequently. Classes basically meet every other day for longer blocks of time. Um, and in developing the block, it wasn't an educational, it wasn't a pedagogy decision. This was, um, this was about min uh, minimizing the cohorts and the number of students that individual students and educators are, are interacting with each day. So um, I, think, I think that hits the, um, the key the keys for each of the three models. Um, again, the, um, similarly to the uh, hybrid in a fully remote model where there's equally um, an equal, or not exactly equal, but there is equally as important the components of both the synchronous and asynchronous learning. So on a, on a regular basis, every day, students are having multiple opportunities where they're engaging with, again, their, their class teacher at the secondary level or home room teacher or an interventionist or specialist uh, or other support personnel. Um, and that would vary depending on the student's needs. So um, those are the three models. And then obviously, and I won't go through to the detail, but we talked about um, in, in a, if we are operating in a full in-person or a rem or hybrid model, we would offer parents um, a fully remote model um, or a fully remote option, I should say. So we are, that is still, um, we're teasing that out. We were waiting for the Department of Ed for quite a while to put some platforms in place. Uh, they finally did do that. We believe that we can use our platforms and uh, do just do a better job than um, sus subscribing students into uh, one of those other systems. So we'll be working with our educators um, and with our resources um, as we've built out those curriculum resources over the years to have those uh, available to us. So in the optional model, um, again, if we're operating, if we transition into a hybrid, um, that would not be necessarily where a student is, is following pace with a, a class specifically. Um, it, it would definitely be more self-paced, um, still working with an educator, still, still making that connection, following the standards and pacing, um, but it would likely be that they wouldn't be connected to a homeroom um, per se. We would do our best to make the connections, uh, but given the nature of that option, um, it, would, it would totally depend on the number of families that chose that and how many students and do we have enough students to build classes um, within that option. So do I, should I stop there? So that, um, that the document you have says a lot less than I just said, shocking. Um, but again, I, can I stop there and ask, are there any key pieces in the, in I, the quick paragraph that I wrote in each of those um, uh, summaries in the executive summary that um, you think needs more information based on your read? Questions from the committee or comments from the committee? Being none, I mean, I would say for, for me, it was um, just a summary of what the larger section said, right. which is what I was expecting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, it's hard to 
not rewrite the mm -hmm. document in executive summary. So <laughs> just be a few pages. Um, all right, so continuing on. So obviously then the, the second most important thing here is that it's confirming the plans as you voted them on Monday night. So as you voted on Monday night, um, you agreed to uh, call it front load the 10 days that were negotiated on behalf of cities and towns by the commissioner. Um, and that means that when all staff report on August 31st, those 10 days bring us to Wednesday, uh, September 16th as the first day of school. Um, as we noted, uh, as we discussed on Monday night, the, the discussion and decision was um, to reassess every three or four weeks. Um, in the document, the way I've um, drafted it, um, it uh, creates a decision point. It's, it's two and a half, I mean, it creates a decision point two and a half weeks into the school year on September 30th for a shift um, on October 13th, which would um, be roughly four weeks into the school year. Um, and then again, using the, the four weeks that we talked about on Monday, um, showing there, so an implementation date of the shift would be October 13th, a decision date would be September 30th, or if we missed that, go to November 10th, decision on October 28th, we missed that, December 8th, and a decision on November 24th, and then, um, and then one more shot, and again, this could continue all year, but modeled a, a return on January 5th in the, in the December 22nd decision. So the decision dates I actually moved forward a week in your calendar because both for Thanksgiving and the Christmas holiday, um, the, your tentative meeting had already been scheduled um, the week prior. So the other, the other piece there is um, in, the, um, in adding those, and we'll talk about the calendar in a second, the 10 days that the state offered, which reduces the number of academic days from 180 to 170, um, those 10 days are all up front. That still does leave three academic day, I'm sorry, um, work days that are professional learning days for educators. So we talked about um, using those in the year, uh, during the year, when uh, we make a transition, having an extra day, um, in order to um, have uh, teachers prepare for that shift. So um, all of these days, if we're shifting from remote um, into hybrid, um, are, are uh, remote days. So um, we basically um, listed there, I have the, the Friday prior to the transition. Um, it's basically the Friday of the, the week after the decision is made and the Friday before we would transition back to hybrid um, is listed there as a professional day. So. Um, the, the, those do not appear on the calendar because I am not proposing that we set those. Um, rather, we schedule those as a decision is made and not use them until we make a transition. Um, obviously, as we keep saying, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, the final thing is that I added in there is the school year calendar. Um, as, we, as we talked about last week, uh, with the 10 days up front, um, that puts the last day of school either on the 16th of June or with five snow days, and we talked about snow days, um, with five snow days, the 23rd. By law, we have to create a calendar with snow days. Um, as I confirmed on Monday night, I would certainly take the approach, unless you tell me otherwise, that um, a snow day will be a remote learning day and be considered an academic day um, rather than continuing the year on into late June. Um, the other key changes in here are um, uh, in our discussions um, with the Teachers Association, and again, to, to, to note, um, we, we have continued negotiations with teachers. We met today, uh, having great discussions. Um, the, uh, there, is a need, uh, there is a need for teachers to have collaboration time and planning time. This is a different world um, that they're um, teaching in. Um, and so they have, obviously many have been participating in optional professional development over the summer. We'll have those 10 days up front, um, but we're looking to add collaboration time. So last year we had scheduled um, eight professional development days um, and we had surveyed parents um, who preferred them on Mondays and Fridays, uh, Mondays or Fridays, I should say. Um, they were traditionally on Fridays. The request was beginning end of the week. We had lots of discussion about um, the value of, of moving them to Wednesdays ultimately made that decision. So in this calendar, that actually changes that up. Um, it leaves the two, two half-day PD days out in May um, intact. Those are important dates that have, or those are important days and that they um, 
making class lists and placement and transitions and all that. There's a lot that happens on those two days um, to get everyone ready for the end of the year um, to be able to um, transition students along. The other six, there were eight total, um, in this calendar, is, they are proposed to be moved to the front half of the year and to Mondays in both the remote, obviously, in the fully remote model, and hopefully in, when we are able to transition to hybrid in October, Mondays remain a remote day in the calendar, in the schedule. So on, um, you can see it's October 5th and 19th, November 2nd and 16th and 30th, and December 14th. It's basically starting in October every other week every other Monday is a half professional development day. Um, the, the rationale behind placing them there is, A, that was the day that parents preferred originally, and B, it's already a remote day, as I said, in both models. So parents will already have planned for their students to be remote. So the difference will be the academic day will stop at the half day point uh, rather than having um, some asynchronous and synchronous learning in the afternoon. So those are the key changes. Um, obviously, um, the, the big uh, points of this executive summary are, are noting the, the start date, the end date, um, the transition times, um, and then an overview of the three models. So I'd certainly welcome any feedback if there are folks who think there's more information that should be added. Um, again, try not to over summarize a document that was already 39 pages long. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. And we'll Thanks, Brian. Um, questions, Maureen? So I, I wanted to ask this, and it was actually raised several times, numerous times, it's actually in the public comment, um, but that is about the review time, and, and is it worth um, maybe trying to review every couple weeks and seeing if, you know, instead of, instead of waiting a month, um, I mean, the first, the first day, the first inflammation, inflammation day is, would come two weeks after we start we make a decision date on september 30th um so i don't know i'm just curious to know what others think about that um you know is it is it uh better to stick with the four weeks or should we should we consider trying to review every two weeks uh, obviously it would mean a lot more meetings for us but i mean fine with me so i'll open that as the first question i guess to the committee and say Feedback, strong opinions on changing it to a two week review instead of a month review. Hollies, are you unmuted for to make a comment or are you? I, I heard all the people. Oh, we lost your audio. How about now? There you go. Sorry, um, I heard the people talking about the need for two weeks, but um, I think two weeks is too often and I would prefer to go with four weeks and keep it on schedule as it is, um, especially because uh, it'll literally be two weeks after the start of the school year. I question if we uh, do it every two weeks, how much uh, heart and soul the teachers are going to be able to put into a situation that may be changing right after they begin. Um, so I, I myself would favor the four week time frame. I, I think there has to be a certain amount of information gathering uh, between times to make it productive. Okay, thanks, Paul. Can I just yeah. jump in? And actually, I want to read something. I meant to read this, and I was trying not to just read the executive summary. <laughs> um, but in regards to the decision and how it will be made, so um, we will rely on updated data and feedback in coordination with our local health departments to determine our readiness to move towards in-person learning. Data considered will include, but not be limited to, the number of number and capacity of local accessible sites offering free rapid testing for minors, the case numbers and trends within the individual schools, the district and our communities, the trained and available local resources for contact tracing, and any, any updated information on safeties from the school facilities. So just to, I know there were some questions about that. Um, so that is, you know, as it is in the executive summary, it does say there isn't a metric, there isn't a color-coded metric, um, but it, I did list there the specific um, items, you know, the, the data points that we'll be considering. Certainly we can create a metric. Um, personal opinion here, I'm always cautious of metrics because when you, when you put metrics down, um, it tends to be the, unfortunately, it tends to be um, what people rely on as a sole data point. Um, and obviously as we've now talked for hours and hours and hours every week, um, if I would love that this would just be 
boil down to one single data point, but the reality is there's, there's multiple factors to consider. So we can certainly tease out um, any of those and data points as far as um, determining a specific um, metric, if you will. Thanks, Brian. Um, Paul Goldner? Just with some school districts in the area opening remote and some opening hybrid models, there's going to be some sort of natural experiment going on on the North Shore. Um, and I'm just wondering if DESE is going to be tracking cases in schools or stemming from schools, um, because that would be an interesting and helpful data point to have as well. So I believe maybe Brian can chime in on this, but I believe what I heard in the governor's press conference on yesterday, could Monday. have been today, oh, Tuesday. honestly, no, was like Tuesday. I said, was it was the Tuesday, okay, yeah. was he said, I believe that they are not going to be tracking these, am I correct? I'm tracking... Outbreaks related to schools. Oh, from my understanding, I don't know of any any process that they are literally gonna be tracking COVID cases by school. They're certainly tracking obviously the plans. And if we, if we opened and had to resort to um, going back to remote for a, a, um, an outbreak, absolutely they would have that data as would DPH and everyone else. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't believe they're, they're tracking that. I will tell you this, superintendents talk all the time. So I will be tracking it. Certainly be you know, paying close attention and certainly you know, uh, each night Committees are meeting all around us over the you know past nights and, and coming nights, including tonight, um, and continuing to grapple with the same discussion. So um, there have been made decisions and gone the other way. So I, it's it continues to be a challenging discussion. So I am absolutely tracking it, but I don't believe Jesse is. And I'd also say that I don't remember who, but the and I'm not supposed to reference it anyway. But the comment made um, about the email that came from the Department of Ed. So we did get a, an email from the Department of Ed. Um, I did. It really doesn't say anything different than the governor said. Um, there is um, a suggestion that they will be um, messaging communities to say your school is this, you should this. Um, they don't have that ready to go for regions yet. So um, there is some acknowledgement um, as, a, as a very general rule, um, whatever the, the topic du jour is, the state often um, makes decisions and information about schools and then they think, Oh yeah, but what about the regions that are three towns? So um, we're awaiting that, but I have not seen that specific. Um, obviously, we can look up our individual towns, uh, which are all white, but not not anything specific for Triton. Tina, I feel like I do actually like and agree with the idea of going to two weeks to evaluate it. But can we keep it as is now with the four weeks and reevaluate changing it to two weeks at that September 30th date, I don't have it in front of me because I mean, it's technically two weeks after the first day of school. Did you hear that, Brian? <laughs> You're muted, Brian. I'm sorry, someone was giving me advice. I think my microphone was rubbing all over the place. I'm sorry, Tina, <laughs> could you say that one more time? I would love to. So I actually do like and agree with the idea that Maureen has brought up in terms of going to to two weeks, but I'm wondering if we can keep it in the document as is with the four weeks and reevaluate on September 30th if we can change it to two week evaluation. Of course. I mean, I think with any document I've ever proposed to you, right, in the district strategy, any, it's a living, breathing document. This is not, um, I have to send this to the Department of Ed, right? We're required, and we keep saying over and over again, we want this document to be helpful to our communities and also satisfy the needs of the Department of Ed. So I don't know that I would even modify it, but absolutely, I do, I will say someone said something about, you know, the first two weeks, it's about two weeks into the school year that you'd be making that, exactly two weeks from the first day of school that you'd be making that first decision. So I think that point, I, I do think the decision would be helpful to have um, uh, 10 school days of remote under our belts, and the majority of schools will have been open for 10 days, so I'm, I'm more interested in our data. Um, and how those first 10 days went as a very important data point. So I would say for the first one, I, I personally like that using September 30th and then the, what is it, 13 days later, a week to prepare for families to organize and then it's the uh, Tuesday after Columbus Day. But after that, I could either draft it differently if that was the will of the committee or we can leave it this way and 
you, you, you all know you can call meetings and meet as, as often as you would like. There's nothing else that um, hinges on that. I think it's good to have it, excuse me, I think it's good to have it in writing. It helps people plan whether, and I'll say people, that's families, that's students, that's educators. So I think it's good to have a plan and stick with it. Um, but there's, there's nothing that precludes us from changing that. No. Other comments from the committee? Questions? Thoughts? I'm going to go do a poll on this one real quick, no vote here, but just a poll to say um, whether you want to leave it uh, as is or go to two weeks so that we know what amendment to include, if any, in the final plan vote. Um, so, sorry, not working my usual spot and um, the paper is getting overwhelming here. Um, Aaron? So I would like to to probably revisit it on the 30th and leave it the way it is for right now. Okay. Um, Paul Goldner? Uh, I would like to leave the document as is um, for now. I think obviously we're going to be continuing to talk about this at every meeting. And if anything major happens in the two weeks time frame rather than the four weeks time frame, there's nothing that says we can't really consider that uh, ahead of time. Okay, so. thank you. Uh, Maureen? I like Tina's suggestion on leaving the document as is. I'm fine with that. Um, and, you know, September 30th, hopefully we will have some good information and we'll see that we're moving in the right direction. Um, and we can decide at that point, but I do think we owe it to our students to try to figure this out as quickly as we can. And I'll say that that work on both Brian and my part is, is still ongoing. It's not like that stopped. It's just, yeah. you know, the focus right now is on final plans, not updates. So. Oh, right. But I'm fine with yeah. keeping this yeah. document as is. I okay. don't think the document itself has to be changed. I think that we just need to keep it in our minds that we, you know, reviewing sure. every couple of weeks if, if, if we can. If there's anything, there might not even be anything to review too, you know? So. Yeah. Caitlin? I like leaving the document as is, and then on September 30th, um, if we decide to change to every two weeks, I'm okay with that too. Okay. Uh, police? Um, I think we should leave it as is. Okay. Uh, Linda? I'd like to leave it as is as well and review it on September 30th as well. Okay. Um, Paul Mayette? Yeah, I think that reviewing it on September 30th is an excellent idea. It, it doesn't lock us into anything now and gives us an opportunity to gather another month and a half worth of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tina? Yes, and I would like to leave it as is right now, but just wanted to acknowledge the fact with information changing so quickly as it's we've seen from, from even Monday night and yesterday, um, that it's something that we should explore at that first checkpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Brian, did you have I was gonna say, so I, I'm gonna go and, and, and encourage us to then come to the September 30th, was that the date? With the mindset that if we believe two weeks is the right number, that we actually do adjust the plan so that we could make that decision and then roll it out saying, here's the new schedule, just because I think that's an important piece for everyone for planning. Um, obviously, if we were going from in-person to remote, that would be even more important. Um, for planning for families, but I think it's still important just, just for multitude of reasons. So I think if we can come on the 30th and just with that mindset that if we can adjust the plan and actually document it for the future, that'd be great. Paulies. So um, the questions were raised about what metrics we're going to use to address hybrid. And, um, you know, the, the governor dumped a, a metric on us yesterday by giving us a color coded breakdown by community. Um, I don't agree with you, Brian. I think that there will be tracking done of COVID, and I think there'll be more tracking than we know what to do with. Um, I would expect that when we come and meet on September 30th, the first time to address this, that the week or two weeks before, we would get a written update from the administration about what the metrics are showing um, around the state and what uh, the testing parameters are, are looking like, because there seem to be some inconsistent callers uh, tonight with the information that we have to date about testing. They seem to suggest it was fairly um, accessible. So um, I fully expect that as we enter the September 30th meeting that we will have received written updates and briefs at least one week to 10 days beforehand so that we can make 
a, a very informed decision at that time. Yeah, and I would just say to clarify, so I was saying that there isn't um, a specific tracking for schools. The, the metric that was released by the governor yesterday, that will be released every week. So that's gonna be a weekly, my understanding is for every community across the state, all 351 communities will have their color consistent or upgraded or downgraded every single week. Yeah, so that is not a something that we'll have to go searching for, that will be provided. Yeah. And I just wanna add in here, um, since I'm kind of the numbers gal, that I find that map to be monumentally unhelpful when it comes to small towns. Um, I did the math for Raleigh, so, cause I had limited time today cause it was, re it's been really busy. And um, I went and looked at Raleigh in particular. And essentially if we have zero to five cases, we would be in the white because if you have less than five cases, that's where you land is the not enough data. As soon as we bump to six cases, it would put us straight into the yellow. We would just bypass the green and go straight into the yellow because we're such a small community that even small numbers of cases um, cause a shift between those different categories really quickly. And then as soon as we hit seven cases, we'd be in red for, our, for rally. Um, and I, I don't, unfortunately don't think that's helpful. Um, I, I just, you know, knowing that this travels in, in households is, is the most common place, um, for transmission between individuals or actually within a household. So that's your, your most common scenario where you're going to see, um, multiple people testing positive. That could be one household. Um, worth of positives or um, as happened earlier this year an outbreak in a nursing home um, that's largely unrelated to our schools that could be it, using that map um, push to hybrid or push to remote so I, I think we need to if there are going to be some sort of metrics which I don't, I don't think it's a bad idea to say if there are X number of cases in our schools or X number of cases in our, our towns um, that that's going to be one of the trigger points I, I don't think that that map can be the trigger point um, for our towns because it just we'd be shut down at every single turnaround I think um, small spike in cases and and school would be out so um so that's troubling I, th I think you know as we come into that first that first checkpoint in september that we should figure something out and we'll definitely be um getting updates as we go on on the work that um we've been doing towards towards testing uh, making sure that there's there's accessible and quick turnaround testing for minors um, and towards contact tracing, making sure that um, the town departments and employees have sufficient resources to be able to do contact tracing. Um, I, I think those are things that we'll be getting constant updates on, but if we're going to take these snapshots, I think they need to be a, a smart, deliberate snapshot of data, um, not something that the the governor decided was a good snapshot for the entire state um, and then just expects us to use because it's like I said I, I don't find it to be particularly helpful so I don't know that was just my take on that I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on metrics Paul Goldner yeah, I mean I think the things that are concerning are also hard to quantify um, contact tracing and testing, um, you know, but also seeing recently a uptick in the state's willingness to enforce social distancing and mask wearing is a positive sign for being able to reopen safely because it's not just what children are doing in schools, uh, but also what's happening in the communities around us and whether families are staying safe outside of school so that the children aren't bringing it in from something that they did in the evening time. Um, so I think, yes, looking at the state numbers, what's our rate per 100,000, what's our te positive testing rate, those are all helpful things as well, but also what are the social indicators? Yeah, uh, Caitlin? Um, Paul stole my thoughts, but I also <laughs> Um, I, want to say, I looked at those numbers too, and I did some math because, you know, that's fun. <laughs> and I, um, I agree with Narissa and I did a little bit more math. Um, 
<laughs> just because I started. Me out. <laughs> well, I went further because you did rally and then I was like, hmm. And it would be really hard to use that map because, and Narissa hit it on the head, that one family could push us to red. So um, although the map is helpful and something to kind of glance at and see how many reds are surrounding the community is always good to know, but the numbers themselves, when you're talking about a much smaller population, um, it's not incredibly useful um, for our kind of three towns because we're just a little too small. But yeah, I agree with Paul and Narissa on those points. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, anybody else? So um, my suggestion would be to leave that language for metrics as it is right now and try to come up with something more to find so that as we come into September 30th um, on our first check-in that, um, that we literally have a, a set list of items to go down for Brian to provide a report on, um, whether it be updates or, or a little literal data number or whatever that happens to be. I don't know, are there any objections to that from the committee, just leaving that language as it, as it is the way that Brian read it in the document for now? Okay, I don't see any objections. Um, I think, Brian, do you have anything else in particular that we needed to look at in that section of the document? I was just, just going to say the one, the one other thing that we talked about um, more extensively on Monday night was transportation. Mm -hmm. So um, the document now states that we're reviewing the use of monitors. Um, Kyle was able to confirm with NRT that it would be, it would range depending on the run, but on average $90 per day, um, which would equate to just a tick under $352,000 um, to run monitors on all 23 buses for 170 days. So again, assuming we're running the buses um, even, again, it would be a little less because in, in a um, remote option when we open on September 16th, we will have some buses in operation. Um, for some uh, high priority students, uh, but it won't be full. But again, with the hope that we're we're transitioning to hybrid as soon as possible, that's that's upwards of three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the year to add monitors. Um, I would say at this point that is a prohibitive number. Um, I don't I don't think we should stop reviewing that and looking at options. We've been talking about the possibility of can we float monitors around? Um, we obviously have cameras on buses, um, so kind of we're actually meeting. The, Friday, Kyle, we're meeting with uh, NRT to talk through right. things. Yep. So um, we'll keep that going, but just so that you're clear, the number is 352,000 and the plan does not commit to that. The plan says we'll continue reviewing that. That was the only other. Only other... Anything else on that, Brian? No, I mean, I, I think the other things, there were, there were definitely tweaks and changes. You know, I've spoken to several of you with little clarifications, um, um, everything from, as Kaylee, who wasn't able to be here tonight, making sure we suggest that visitors are also expected to bring their masks, we'll have them if they don't have them. Um, so I, I think I think it hit a bunch of the little tweaks that um, folks kept or talked about and captured them, talked about on Monday that I captured here. Um, but again, there was the only major additions or, or um, you know, wholesale changes was the executive summary, the letter, um, the calendar, and then that, that uh, added language about transportation. Okay, thank you. Sorry, flipping between screens. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. So Brian, on the you says three hundred and fifty thousand per year for bus monitors on all the buses. Yep. Does I mean, do we have to sign a year contract? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, I mean, could my thinking is maybe it's possible to hire um, monitors for the first few weeks of the transition into a hybrid just so they can assist with you know making sure the students know where to go on the bus how to get on and off the bus properly and then once those students are in a routine we might be able to you know not have monitors I don't know, I don't know. yeah I mean it's it's anytime you're hiring um, when you take employees on well, right. you take on obviously lots of costs and unemployment then when they leave so right. I, don't, I don't believe we would be able to ask NRT to hire them for two weeks. But I mean, we also had a discussion about volunteers. I, I did have a couple parents email me to say they will absolutely not volunteer on buses. Um, but I haven't, but maybe there are people who'd be willing to volunteer on the bus. Um, are, are there, depending again on um, if there are a large number of people who are 
um, choosing the remote option when we shift to hybrid. Do we have staff that we could put on buses? There's nothing in our contract um, that precludes us from being able to put our own staff um, onto vehicles. So we're still gonna explore all the options. It doesn't just mean that we have to write a check for $350,000. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to have that discussion with them on Friday. Um, on right. the specifics of how we can make that work. Because I, I was thinking if we can use our own staff, perhaps yep. there would be some people that yep. would be willing to, I mean, if, obviously we would have to pay them, but um, yep. you know, if they were willing to do it for a couple of weeks, if let's, for example, if it was an IA that, mm -hmm. you know, okay, I'll go in early and, and ride the bus and, and then, then they go right to work and then they've gotten, you know, yeah. don't need them after a couple of weeks if the kids have adjusted to the, to the new routine, I, you know, I don't know. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. We'll talk through that. Yeah, it is not. That's a key point is it's not just we say yes and we get a bill for 352000 No. Okay. There are options. Tina had her hand up and then I think she disappeared. Was, was there say, anyone Tina else? disappeared. <laughs> was there anyone else who wanted to, uh, to comment on buses and monitors? or anything else in the document. Open it there as well. I do not see any hands. All right, um, sounds like it, it stays as is then. So can I get a motion to approve the draft, plan, uh, approve the final plan for reopening schools to include documentation of details for all three models, full return, full remote or hybrid, all corresponding details for school operations and the confirmation of the model under which schools will open in September, titled the district plan for the reopening of schools, August 12th, 2020, please. So moved. I'll thank second you. it. Is that Linda who is a second? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, um, any further discussion? All right, and I need to- are you, yeah. are you okay with me just adding some language to just further clarify? I mean, there was, as I said, there was some language that kind of repeated hybrid, but I think um, to a couple of the questions, I think there are some folks who would like to just see a little more clarity on the remote. Are you okay with us adding more or given that you're taking a vote on it, would you like to leave it as is? I have no problem with, as long as it's, as long as it's clarifications and not changes. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. I do not have a problem with that. Yep. <laughs> And likely reusing some of the language in hybrid to make sure that it it's clear that it's it's what a remote day looks like. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Anyone else have an objection to that? Okay. Um, seeing none, I need a roll call vote for the motion on the table. Um, Aaron. Yes. Thank you. Paul Goldner. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Uh, Caitlin. Yes. Paul Lees. Yes. Linda? Yes. Paul Mayette? Yes. Tina? Yes. And I am yes as well, so that's a unanimous vote. Thank you all. Um, so the next item on the agenda is actually um, going into executive session, but before we do that, there is one thing we need to do, um, and that's talk about our next meeting date. Um, so I didn't have a chance to get it out before, um, before this meeting, because I was kind of I was kind of, um, I, it was a busy afternoon. I couldn't quite get to it. Um, but looking at the, the doodle poll that I sent out for the district communications committee meeting, um, it looks like the 18th at 630 is the best day. So um, that's next Tuesday. Um, so I'll set up a, um, uh, send out a notification and then Brian is gonna get an agenda together. Or we're gonna work together to get an agenda together um, for meeting with the town officials at that meeting on that day um, and then we would like to propose um, that we actually skip a week um, because every moment that we don't have or that we have brian and kim and david and kyle in a meeting is a time that they are not able to prepare and plan and everything else that they need to do offline and uh it's been an intense meeting schedule and i think now is the time for action and i i believe that they they need to all the time that we can possibly give them for that. Um, as 
a result, my recommendation would be that we go with the next business meeting, which is August 26th at 7 p.m. as our next meeting. I don't know if the committee members have strong feelings about a whole two weeks um, without a meeting, but if you don't, um, that would be my proposal. Does anyone have any objections to the 26th being our next meeting date? Okay, and we're gonna, the intent would be to handle our regular business. So we have a mountain of um, minutes to approve from the last few months uh, that will go through the consent agenda. We'll handle a lot of the things that we, um, routine business that we normally do at our August meeting, um, and then have an update on everything that's going on for reopening plans as part of that. Brian, did you have anything to add? I think that was it, okay. I did not. All right, Paul Goldner. Do we have to approve the updated calendar or does the approval of the, that covers it? Yes, because it's in there. Yeah. So once we voted it, we vote, voted the whole calendar, but thank you, yeah. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, let me switch back so I can get the motion. Uh, can I get a motion to uh, go into executive session for the purpose of planning for negotiations with union personnel, not to return to open session, please? I'll make that motion. Thank you. Can I guess? Second. Thank you, Aaron. All right, and I need a roll call vote to go into executive session, please. Aaron? Yes. Paul Goldner? Yes. Thank you. Maureen? Yes. Caitlin? Yes. Paulise? Yes. Linda? Yes. Paul Mayette? Yes. Tina? Yes. Good. And I'm a yes as well. All right. Thank you all. And um, I will see some of you Tuesday, I believe, and some of you uh, next week. And I'll just say for the benefit of um, anyone who's still on, if you do have follow up questions or comments from tonight, uh, you are welcome to send them to the school committee at school committee at tritonschools.org. I will get you a response as fast as possible. I usually try to do it in a couple hours, but I've been out sometimes to a full day at this point. Um, and we'll just get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you for coming tonight and um, we're going to move into executive session. All right.